Welcome back, everybody. It's the Fantasy Pros Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bogman. Follow me on the Twitter at Bogman Sports. I'm joined, as always, by the illustrious Pat Fitzmorris. Follow him on the Twitter at Fitz underscore FF. You're heading out after we do this show, right? Or I guess tomorrow morning. Uh, so we're recording a little bit earlier than usual. You might get a little loosey-goosey uh, Bogman and Fitz here. That'll be fun, right? Yes, sir, Boggs. Uh, going to Kent, Ohio for the Fantasy Football Expo, which is fun. It's it's fantasy Twitter come to life. Um, you no, know, there are a lot of <laughs> lot of great people there, a lot of great people from the Dynasty community, a lot of our uh, recurring guests. You know, I'm going to get to see, uh, you know, Shane Manila, of course, uh, you know, Russ Fisher, who we just had on, a lot of great people there. So I'm excited about it, Boggs. And we're coming up on our first full week of preseason football. So we're going to get some interesting developments to uh, oh, chew on yeah. here. Oh, yeah. We're going to get all kinds of stuff. There's going to be injuries, as there always is. Hopefully, we don't have the lights going off on any stadium like they do at, at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I mean, come on, man. Like, just move that game or scrap it or spend the money to fix that stadium uh, because it's always something. Remember, they had to just not play the game a couple of years ago because the surface was horrible. And then the lights went out this time. So... I don't know. Like, do y'all want to play that game or not? Figure it out. Like, that is just so strange. But the weirdly enough, Boggs, I'm going to be drafting in that stadium on Saturday morning. <laughs> well, hopefully everything works for you. Uh, yeah, there, you know, fingers. I, I crossed. need lights. I need lights on to help me with. Yeah, the draft, yeah. So. You, you, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be that bad. But uh, I'm excited for you, man. That's going to be fun. I wish I could go. Just uh, can't make it uh, at this point in the year. But uh, I know I'll be there someday soon, and it's going to be uh, a lot of fun when I go. And you guys are going to have a ball uh, today on the show. We're going to be talking about buy lows for your dynasty leagues. And now um, do you have a definition for a buy low guy? Does it have to be? Cause I mean, I don't, I think some rookies are buy low this year. Um, I think rookies are buy low pretty much every year, which is why people like to invest in them at the back end of the draft, right? Just in case one blows up of a regular redraft, but in, in dynasty, even where these guys are, probably pushed up. Some of them are maybe pushed up a little bit too much, right? Uh, just because they're young and they have their whole career in front of them. But is that is is some is there a specific player that's a buy low to you or can it be any type of player as long as they're below what you think is going to be their future value? For a lot of these guys that I'm going to list today, Boggs, their value is at rock bottom right now. Rock bottom. Okay. There is nowhere to go but up. Some of them, uh, a couple maybe not at rock bottom. I would say three of these guys are at rock bottom for sure. <laughs> and uh, you're right, though. A dynasty, a, a rookie can be a buy low in dynasty, Boggs, because some of you know, for those of us who do our drafts early, like right after the NFL draft, some of these guys do lose value after the draft. Like everyone was really excited about Kendra Miller. Um, right. And, and since then, there have been some injury questions. There have been some questions about whether the, the Saints might add someone else to the mix. Uh, there's the reduction of the Alvin Kamara suspend or a lighter suspension than we anticipated for Alvin Kamara. So right. um, I, I would say Kendra Miller is maybe not <laughs> held in uh, as high esteem now as he was back in, you know, early May. Right. And, you know, injured players and uh, c can be in there as well. Uh, you know, a guy like Hendon Hooker. I mean, the the Lions, he's a rookie and the Lions just went out and signed Teddy Bridgewater because it doesn't look like Hooker is going to be ready. Um, you know, and really, even if he is ready, they don't know what they have because they can't watch him play now because he's not playing. So people are not even thinking about Hendon Hooker. He's a guy that I almost put on this list. Um, you know, like you mentioned, a couple rookies were Sean Johnson, uh, Chase Brown, because who knows if Mixon sticking around next year, right? Luke Musgrave has been getting a lot of buzz. Like there's some rookies here that could be at their lowest value right now in this draft because they're going to have significant roles. And I'll tell you what I did, Fitz, was I've been doing a lot of the same names so I try to go all original names. I don't know that I've mentioned these guys on many other podcasts, uh, specifically this one. Uh, but yeah, I tried to go original names here. So it was tougher uh, than normal. I, I worked on this probably a little bit longer than I should have. That's but, good because um, uh, I'm talking about a lot of the. I, I'm playing the hits. <laughs> I'm playing the hits, Boggs. It's, it's, it's hey, that's what I did hits. last week. 
That's what I did last week. I played the hits. I was like, hey, I want to hit these guys over the head with these. I think these are the guys that you can get late in your draft. So I tried to come up with some original names, uh, but maybe some of them aren't that original. But uh, before we dive into it, we, we each have five, by the way. So it's going to be 10 names here. But I got to tell you guys about the Fantasy Pro Championship at FFPC is here to test your skills. Battle for your share of the six million dollar prize pool including the massive one million dollar grand prize and score free subscriptions to both fantasy pros and betting pros register now at fantasypros.com slash championship and use the promo code fantasy pros all caps for 25 dollars off your entry outplay your competitors in a 12 uh, team league throughout a 12 week regular season with weekly waivers lineup choices and no trades rank among the top two in your uh in your uh, or win your league's playoffs to move into the championship round and compete for the grand prize during weeks 15 through 17. Again, that's fantasypros.com slash championship. Today, use the promo code fantasypros for a $25 discount. And now go out there and dominate. That is going to be a lot of fun. But with no further ado here, Fitzy, let's get into some of these buy low players. I will let you start first because... You've got a quarterback here, and uh, so give me your quarterback, and I think you only have one running back, and then we'll go to my running back. So we'll kind of try to keep it a little positional here, um, and your, your RB is ranked higher than mine anyway. So uh, let, let's hear your first QB here. All right, well, I said I was going to play the hits, Boggs, and it's uh, almost obligated contractually for me to bring up Trey <laughs> Lance. And look, it is hard to trade for a quarterback in super flex. Generally, if you want to upgrade yourself at the position, you have to do it in your rookie drafts. But I think Trey Lance presents a chance for you to get a high upside quarterback for a very modest cost. And modest might be understating it, Boggs. I said, like, for a lot of these guys, their value is at rock bottom. Trey Lance's value is at rock bottom. Like, we just mentioned Kendra Miller. I think you might be able to trade Kendra Miller straight up for Trey Lance. And, uh, you know, certainly you could do it for, I don't know, Christian Kirk. I think if you right. offer the Trey Lance uh, investor Christian Kirk for him straight up, he would be happy to cash out, he or she. Um, and, you know, like, I think the value is even lower on Lance than it was a month ago now that Brock Purdy is known to be healthy and the overwhelming favorite to be the week one starter for the 49ers. But look, Boggs, Lance was the third overall pick in the 2021 draft. And I know that doesn't necessarily mean anything because we have seen quarterbacks who were drafted early not pan out. Certainly Zach Wilson, who was picked sure. one spot ahead of Trey Lance. Um, but Along. they all get second, third, fourth chances. Chances, Every yes. Every single we, QB. Right. Jamarcus Russell, Tim Couch, David Carr going back through the years. That's Tim the thing, Tebow. Tim Tebow. And that's the thing that makes Lance different from those guys, Boggs. Those guys all had chances and failed. Lance has not really gotten his chance yet. And here's another mitigating circumstance with Lance Boggs. He was always going to be something of a project. We knew that going in. He played basically one full college season right. and he played at North Dakota state against inferior competition. So he made two starts last season, one of which was in a rainstorm in Chicago. And then he broke his ankle in the other. And he has not really had sufficient opportunity to show off that NFL caliber arm or the rushing ability that could make him such a valuable fantasy asset. And we know he's going to run like this dude can run. Um, Look, I know Brock Purdy played well last season, but he also feasted on a very easy slate of opponents over the second half of the regular season. Uh, when he faced the Cowboys in the playoffs, they basically shut him down. So whether Lance gets his opportunity with the 49ers this year or with some other team next year, that opportunity is going to come eventually. I think he's the ultimate buy low in Dynasty. Yeah, I love this pick, and, and this is uh, an outstanding pick. And what we said before, you know, like second, third, fourth opportunity, Sam Darnold's still on an NFL roster, right? He was bad with the Jets. He was bad with Carolina. But, you know, San Francisco, uh, they think they can fix him. So, you know, they went after him day one. He's in. He might be the second guy behind Purdy. So Trey Lance might slip to that third. And, and trust me, when that depth chart comes out, I bet you it's going to have Trey Lance at third, 
and that is when he will hit absolute rock bottom. Uh, you know, and, and so it might even get worse from what we're talking about today. And um, you know, get into the season a little bit, and especially if you're in a super flex league, if he's not playing, he's eating up a roster spot. People are gonna want to go and see if they can ditch him and just get somebody else because you know. Maybe the Niners are a little more beholden to him because of the capital they spent to get him, but your fantasy player isn't in your league. They don't care. So go get him. Go scoop him up for a late pick or, you know, a player that's on your bench that maybe you don't even need. You know, I think this is a great one to point out. I think Trey Lance is absolutely a buy low right now. And uh, I think you should at least try to see what it would cost to go get him. So uh, good first one out of the gates here. Fitzy, who's number two? Antonio Gibson. And maybe the value is starting to creep up a little, Boggs. Um, maybe it reached its nadir last year. Um, Gibson just turned 25. And um, like I've gone on about how he is as big and as fast as Jonathan Taylor and is a former college receiver. So he has that pass catching skill set. Um, and like this is a dude who scored double digit touchdowns in his first two years in the league. But last year, he had the fewest number of touches since he's been in the league because he clearly fell out of favor with uh, then Washington offensive coordinator Scott Turner. So, um, you know, it was kind of a lost year. And, and granted, uh, Gibson may have gotten himself in the doghouse with his six fumbles in 2021. So maybe maybe they just lost confidence in him. But now he's got a clean slate with Eric Bieniemy, the commander's new offensive coordinator. And I'm, I'm hoping that the enemy sees Gibson as like a Jarek McKinnon plus, uh, a, a guy who can play as the primary passing down back, and he definitely has that skill set, but also maybe be a goal line guy, maybe share a lot of that early down work with Brian Robinson. And, you know, look, Brian Robinson, we've talked about this, Boggs. I mean, I think he's a perfectly serviceable early down grinder but he's not special gibson is potentially right. special with that size speed combination and the pass catching skill set so um it, if the enemy is more enchanted with that skill set than scott turner was boggs i think there could be a bonanza coming for uh gibson in 2023 uh, currently, his dynasty ECR for Gibson is 37. So I just want to, I'm going to list off some running backs. You tell me if you take any of these guys over Gibson. We'll go to the top of the tier here. Would you, would you take uh, Brian Robinson? Obviously not. Nope. Uh, Khalil Herbert? No. AJ Dillon? Definitely not. Kendra Miller? No. Alvin Kamara? No. Alexander Madison? Mm. that's a Maybe little right more, now that, that, yeah, that might be okay short, short window for sure so that's a little more interesting um we and, round and, out with like pacheco a chain james cook montgomery dalvin cook zach charbonnet maybe charbonnet over there i know you're a devin a chain guy so two, maybe yeah. him uh james cook or isaiah pacheco maybe james cook Close call. There. I would say Pacheco, maybe not Cook. So, but but yeah, I mean, look, um, he's right in this range, and that range would bring him all the way up to like twenty five. So, like, it, you know, right around your first RB three instead of one of your last RB threes. So, uh, yeah, I think he is absolutely undervalued, and like you said, buy buy low on a guy uh, who has fumbled, and people like Brian Robinson, and we haven't seen it yet, but. Every day in camp, I feel like we're getting more and more and more buzz about Antonio Gibson. So uh, another good one here. Anything more to add on Gibson? No, that's it. Let's hear your first cat dogs. All right. My first guy here, I'm going to go with, uh, we'll start at the running backs. I'll go with Zamir White. And uh, look, he's working with the first team offense and Josh McDaniels has been impressed by his leap from his rookie season into his second season. I think if Jacobs does sign, which he's not there right now, he's not even in camp, which is very concerning. So, uh, you know, I I still have in my brain, even though I saw Le'Veon Bell crash and burn by holding out and everything, I still have in my head that all these running backs are going to get back into the game 
and not have an issue moving forward because that's what happens most of the time. I think the last time I brought this up, someone subtweeted us and said, well, Emmett Smith in the nineties, but come on, man, like that's not recent, you know, uh, let, let's use more current examples and bell ruined it. You know, he ruined his career and the Steelers run game for a couple of years by holding out. And so, uh, you know, maybe Josh Jacobs does that. I expect him to sign a deal, but I think if he does, uh, I think that it's going to be a deal like Saquon. And even if he doesn't, even let's say he signs a long-term extension, he cannot keep putting up 393 touches. That is not sustainable by any stretch of the imagination. So Zamir White is going to have a role, and he has time right now in camp and preseason to prove himself to be put into a bigger role. And right now, his dynasty ECR is 66, so he's a mid-tier RB6 on your team. His ADP is even further down the board in PPR leagues right now, just looking at our draft wizard. So this guy is buried. So even if you're in a deeper dynasty league, I think this is a dude that right now, specifically if you are rostering Josh Jacobs, you want to go get him, you want to handcuff, and it shouldn't cost you more than a late rookie pick or a wide receiver with a little bit more juice. You know, like if I came to you and I offered you uh, Juju for your Zamir White, I think you'd probably pull the trigger on that pretty quick. So with Jacobs kind of floundering here, uh, we know that the Raiders don't have a lot of money to spend, so maybe they don't go after a running back, and going after a running back is not really in vogue right now. They could draft somebody next year, but I think this dude's going to get an opportunity to play more this year with a further look down the road as well, so maybe a later season acquisition for you also, um, depending on what type of deal Josh Jacobs signs. But right now, he's pretty close to as low as he's going to get, in my opinion, because I think this is a pretty good back. Yeah, Zamir White is really interesting, Boggs. And um, I'll, I'll get my two reservations about him out of the way first. The f the big one is that he he's not really a pass catcher. So that's going to be uh, – maybe limit his ceiling somewhat in Dynasty unless he is a real heavy-duty runner, like gets a, a lot of carries. And potentially he could do that if he proves himself. The other is that um, he has this – you know, he's already had one knee surgery – and he has got this hard charging style. Like he does not shy away from contact. Very Isaiah Pacheco like with his yeah. running style. Maybe not quite that reckless, but um, you know he's a guy who's going to take some punishment if he runs the ball a lot. So um, those are my two worries that you know he doesn't catch passes, and there might be a higher injury risk than you would associate with a typical back, perhaps. But um, He's really interesting as a runner, though, Boggs. I mean, he was yeah. really impressive in college. Like, just a, a downhill style. You can almost see a little bit of, of Nick Chubb in Georgia. Him. That's um, yeah, probably a little I mean, college like it, scouting. But, yes, I mean, that's how they that's how they train their guys. And that's what he looks like. Yeah, yeah, it's too easy to make that comp. But, like, you can almost squint and see it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love uh, watching him at, at Georgia. He's a big part of that uh, run game there. So uh, of the the national title guys. So I am uh, excited about him in his future. Another guy that is uh, free right now, and he's third on the depth chart. But Zach Evans, running back for the Rams here, third on the depth chart, like I said. But the Rams traded up for Evans, and he has a much more complete game, in my opinion, than Kyron Williams. And Acres is a UFA after this season. So, and you know, look, the Rams have nine spots on defense that they need to replace before they even bother looking at a running back. Let's say a couple of those spots play well, right? Let's say three of them play well. They still have six spots to replace on defense before they are even thinking about going after a running back. So with Zach Evans having a, you know, more complete skill set, in my opinion, than Kyron Williams, Akers potentially being gone, you know, he's free right now. He's RB 74, 240th overall on draft wizard for PPR leagues. And his ECR is much higher than that at 56. So his ECR is 56. He's going off at RB74. And look, most of your leagues aren't going to take into account the difference between, you know, a dynasty league and a regular 
PPR league, they're just going by ADP when you're clicking on it or just, you know, regular this season rankings when you're on that website. So if you're doing a, a first year player draft or if you've already done your draft and maybe this guy is sitting out on the wire, maybe you have a spot on, on your roster. You can just grab and stash, you know, if you have a deeper league, I think Zach Evans could potentially be interesting after this season, maybe even in this season, although Kyron Williams is making a lot of noise in camp right now. And Acres is the better back. I'll say that. You know, there's always a chance they re-sign Acres, but I don't think Zach Evans is that much further behind these guys. Maybe just because he's a rookie right now, and I definitely think he'll move past Kyron Williams by the end of the season. So Zach Evans is a dude that I'm very interested in acquiring right now for very cheap, or just straight up picking up off the wire because he's available in a lot of leagues. Yeah, maybe he is available at some bugs, but uh, like back in um, rookie draft season in, in May, it seemed like there was maybe even a little more interest in him than there would typically be for a running back who was chosen in like the, the back half of the second round of the sixth round. Um, he's an interesting case for sure. Like, I don't think he is a flawless prospect by any means, obviously being a sixth rounder, but like a, a guy who was usurped by freshman Quinchon Judkins at uh, Ole Miss last year, basically. So, And he like, moved it, from TCU to go to Ole Miss to get more playing time, and then Quinchon Judkins was one of the best running backs in the country as a freshman last year. Yeah, there's really no shame, I think, in, in losing yeah. your job to Judkins, who is, is potentially going to be, you know, maybe even a first-round NFL pick at some point. But, um, yeah, Evans, he is an interest. I totally agree that he's better than Kyron Williams. And I think he is going to be, at least for early down usage, Kyron has that third down skill set. But as far as early right. down guy, like he's clearly going to be the backup to Cam Akers, I believe, especially with the Sony Michelle retirements, Un unless <laughs> they bring someone else in and where the Rams going to get the money for that. You know, they've, they've yeah. gone all in. So um, and we have seen Boggs. Cam Akers fall out of favor once before. Now, now possibly. um Things got settled, but there was a brief time in 2022 where Cam Akers was estranged from the team. Right. That was a very weird deal. And then he comes back and gets used as a workhorse down the stretch. So kind of a weird thing. We we don't know the Rams level of commitment to Akers just now. But yeah, Evans is like a, a sneaky handcuff. And maybe there is, uh, you know, like he could slide through that crack, that crevice of opportunity at some point right. in 2023 and suddenly become a very valuable fantasy asset. And I think, you know, this is the year, like, kind of like you mentioned, they're up against the cap. They've had issues. They're kind of burning this year. That's why they traded Ramsey. They traded everybody but Aaron Donald, Matt Stafford, and Cooper Cup, right? Like, those are the guys that they have. Then they're going to have to rely on them. So I think they're not going out spending money. You know, I think they're just kind of burning this year. And this is a year to kind of figure it out. Uh, this is the year to, to see who is going to be on this roster long term? So I think a lot of these guys on this roster as a whole are going to get a shot, not just the running backs, but I do think Zach Evans can benefit from that. Before we move on, want an idea of how cheap your favorite buy low target trade targets are? Stop guessing and get instant analysis with our trade analyzer at fantasypros.com slash analyzer, whether it's a two for one, a three for two, or an even trade. The trade analyzer has got your back. It's also perfect for dynasty leagues and sports trades with draft picks. The trade analyzer lets you see how your league power rankings shift before and after the trade. Navigate your negotiations with confidence and head over to fantasypros.com slash analyzer to start evaluating your trade offers now. Also, if you love this show, you want to interact with Pat and I directly. We will be answering your questions each week for premium subscribers on Fantasy Pros at 5 p.m. Eastern over on our Discord at fantasypros.com slash dynasty chat. Obviously, Pat will not be there with me this week because he will be living it up in Canton, but it's okay, Pat. I'll go ahead and hold down the fort by myself this week. You can have some time off. That's fine. Uh, but all right, we are ready to move on to some wide receivers here. So, Fitzy, who is your first wide receiver you want to talk about? It's Elijah Moore, and I think this is the cheapest we are going to see Elijah Moore for the foreseeable future, but the breakout is coming, Boggs. And as a rookie in 2021, Moore had a six-game stretch 
from week 8 to week 13, where he had 34 catches for 459 yards and five touchdowns. Over those six weeks, he was the uh, wide receiver four in PPR fantasy, scoring behind only Justin Jefferson, Keenan Allen, Cooper Cup. So the quarterbacks... <laughs> pretty good were spot to be in. Pretty good spot to be in, good company. And the quarterbacks who were throwing him the ball while he was going nuclear during that span, Zach Wilson, Mike White, Joe Flacco and Josh Johnson. So basically during those six weeks, Jets quarterbacks were basically doing two things, uh, throwing the ball to Elijah Moore and getting hurt. That's about all that was going on with Jets quarterbacks. Um, Moore's a good route runner, good hands, very productive in his final two seasons at Ole Miss after A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf had left. Um, he averaged almost 150 receiving yards per game in his junior year, which was his, his final so college much season. So much fun to watch. Yeah, and, uh, and then he had that super productive stretch with the Jets in his rookie year. But 2022 uh, let Dog a lot of air. Yeah, yeah. And, and like he wasn't getting the ball from Zach Wilson, and he didn't handle it well, Boggs. Like, not yeah. at all. He, he basically sulked his way out of New York and forced a trade to the Browns. So the good news is that it does seem like the Browns are intent on using him and getting the ball into his hands. Like, I, I saw a training camp highlight today where they, he was lined up in the backfield and they threw him a little swing pass. Yeah. So um, do that, man. Get this ball guy the ball and let him do his thing. So I'm really excited about the future for Elijah Moore, and I think it's a good time to get in on him if uh, you don't have, have him on your roster. Yeah, I mean, his ECR right now for Dynasty Leagues is uh, wide receiver 43. His ADP... Uh, on the draft wizard is a uh, wide receiver 48. So your last wide receiver four in a 12 man league. So your first wide receiver off the bench or potentially a flex player is where he stands right now. Hovering, I think right around pick 100 ish, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, uh, you know, I have, I have positives about Elijah Moore because I think he is super talented and I love the fact that he gets out of that mess in New York, right? And he is in Cleveland. And like you said, they're designing plays for him. There's been a uh, notable, uh, you know, reports about the rapport between himself and Watson this off season, uh, how good he's looked in camp. He's torturing all the corners and torturing them. It's awesome, right? My little concern for him is I still don't trust Watson because of all the rust that he had last year. And this is a run first and run second offense that they have in Cleveland. The line is built for it. Nick Chubb is there and he's option one and two. So, and in Joku kind of came around last year. So he's going to demand some targets too. Amari Cooper is probably, you know, on his way out as far as his NFL career stands. He's still going to have a couple great years, but Mother Nature is going to get him pretty soon. So is more going to be the guy to stand up and take that spot or is he going to have an attitude problem when they start running the ball and he doesn't get 10 targets every single game and have a little fit again? So to me, it's more about the offense and his attitude and maybe this same stuff happening here in Cleveland than it happened in New York. I hope I'm wrong about that because this dude has so much talent. And I mean, as much as I don't want to see him have success on the Browns because I'm a Steelers fan, I do think he can and I think he will. So I'm behind this one as well. Um, my first wide receiver here, I'll, I'll throw at yeah, I'm going to go with Cortland Sutton and Sutton is getting big praise heaped on him right now. Fits by new head coach Sean Payton. They had him study Michael Thomas's film from 2019 and it, I just want to give you his numbers, Michael Thomas's 2019 numbers, 185 targets, 149 catches, 1725 for the yards and nine scores that it's ridiculous to expect that. But how about, you know, a couple more targets for Sutton? How about 150 targets, right? He had 125 last year on an offense that was miserable. Um, but the lowest PPR point per game total for a player with 150 targets since 2019 was wide receiver 27 when DJ Moore in 2021, he only scored four touchdowns. But every other player with 150 targets or more has finished in a PPR league as low as wide receiver 13. So almost a wide receiver one for everybody that got that amount of targets. Now, is he going to get that? 
I don't know. You know, they got a pretty good run game with Javante and Samaje P. Ryan, but we know Sean Payton is here. And by the way, Sutton, you know, Sutton has been pretty solid with the likes of Keenum, Flacco, Drew Locke, and Bridgewater, and then the corpse Russell Wilson last year. He hasn't had one quarterback throw the most passes for this team two years in a row in his entire career. This is going to be the first year where Russell Wilson threw the most passes last year, and he'll throw the most this year, of course, unless he gets hurt. So I think that could be big for him building a rapport. I think Sutton is primed to be one of the biggest risers from the Peyton higher. His ECR right now is wide receiver 48. His ADP is wide receiver 42 in PPR leagues. And I think this is a guy that you can go get right now, and he can at least bring you high-end wide receiver three numbers and not be a low-end wide receiver four, where do you stand on Cortland Sutton, Fitzy? You know, it's funny, Boggs. Like, people have been so off on this Bronco. Like, people seem ready to throw, shove all their chips into the middle with one guy or the other. And last year, it was Sutton, who everyone was betting on. And and I was actually one of the, and I'm not doing this to uh, brag or, or blow my own horn, but... I mean, I kind of wondered last year, like, are we really sure Sutton is the best receiver in Denver? And uh, I had this debate with Andrew Erickson, and as a result, he owes me a pizza for this, which is going to have <laughs> pineapple on it, by the way, because we also debated the merits of pineapple on pizza, which I think is fabulous. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But the funny thing is, and, and the bat bogs was a straight up bat Cortland Sutton versus DK Metcalf for Ooh, fantasy wow. points last yeah. year. So, yeah, I. Okay. I dusted him in that one but sure. who's to say that Cortland Sutton couldn't be the discount uh DK Metcalf for Russell Wilson this year and who's to say that now Jerry Judy is so much better than Cortland Sutton which everyone seems to believe this year and again I'm thinking like eh, is he really well they made it work with Jarvis Landry Jarvis Landry was outstanding for New Orleans with Michael Thomas Good point. right so Good point. you know they made them both work yeah, I mean, like, I, I just don't think, uh, just as people perceived a big gap between Sutton and Judy last year, favoring Sutton, now everyone's perceiving this big gap and favoring Judy. And, like, I think the gap is is narrower between these two than is commonly perceived. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of high on Sutton if the price is low. Like, I think it's a, a logical buying opportunity for a guy that everyone was pretty high on last year. Yeah, I think I was mixing up Jarvis Landry with somebody else because he was good with Cleveland, not with New Orleans. And New Orleans, uh, he was only with New Orleans last year. But uh, y you get my point. I mean, look, Michael, Tom like they're they're telling him to watch the Michael Thomas film, right? Like that. That's the whole thing. Michael Thomas had 185 targets that year. That's the thing that intrigues me. It's the amount of targets. Do I think that he is Michael Thomas? in his prime no i don't but i do think that if he's the number one here he can get a ton of targets and absolutely uh make it work now i just want to see who was second in receptions on that saints team since it wasn't uh so it was well it was alvin Kamara, and they had jared cook and then they had a mix of like ted ginn and traquan and Taysom hill had a bunch of targets it was kind of a mess after michael thomas so 185 targets is not really realistic for anybody uh but being a number one in this offense is very advantageous for whoever it is so uh look i set this all up here fitzy so we can argue at first because i know we're gonna go long here on this debate a little bit uh so and i set this up you gave me your names first and i went i gotta do one contrarian with fitzy so uh let's hear your wide receiver that you want to argue for and then i'll go into the other corner Oh, uh, listen, Bogman, we might not have quite the vigorous argument you're expecting here on this one, because okay. while I had conviction with my uh, touting of Elijah Moore and Antonio Gibson and even Trey Lance, I'm nowhere near that level of conviction on Kadarius Tony. In fact, Boggs, okay. I think I might need to go into a 12 step program for Kadarius uh -oh. Tony because I've been, <laughs> you know, honking his horn all off season yeah. and i mean yeah I, I you know do feel like i need to meet with the other Kadarius tony truthers in a, <laughs> a church basement somewhere with like stale donuts and tepid coffee because i just like i can't quit this guy and i need to quit this guy boggs i mean the the knee injury man like one of the first 
days of, of training camp and he hurts his knee. And this from a guy who has missed 15 games in his first two seasons, has injured seemingly every body part imaginable, got COVID twice in one year. <laughs> Um, it, it's just like one thing after another with this guy. It, it really does seem like he is the second coming of Percy Harvin, this yeah. extraordinarily talented athlete who just whose body couldn't cooperate uh, with him to play NFL football for whatever reason. And what we have seen of him in some of the short bursts, just insane athleticism, just uh, like a, a coiled spring waiting to uh you know snap off the line of scrimmage and he's drawn targets i mentioned this bogs at, at just this crazy high rate and the stat I've, I've mentioned it on this show since he's come into the league he has been targeted on 17.3 percent of all his snaps that includes running plays too and and just to compare that like justin jefferson the 2022 target leader was targeted on 17.1% of his snaps last year. So Tony has beaten that rate. And yes, like a, a lot of it is kind of manufactured stuff close to the line of scrimmage. When he's coming in to the game, you know, as a rotational player, it's like, well, they're kind of maybe designing a play for him, right? So some, you kind of know the ball is going to go towards him, or at least it has a high likelihood of going towards him when he comes in too, because he plays, he plays less snaps than Jefferson. So the percentage is higher but when he's on the field he's on the field to catch the ball or move the ball so yeah, yeah that's a, th that's, that's a, a great part point right he's, yeah. he's never going to be an 80 or 90 percent or, or 95 percent snap guy like justin jefferson he's going to be right. a, a schemed guy but boy if you want him in a schemed offense put him in the big meaty hands of andy reed and let andy yeah. reed draw plays for this guy and, and let Patrick Mahomes get this dude the ball in open space. So, man, I'm, I'm still just dreaming of what could be Boggs. And even though he's not going to play in the preseason, he's probably going to miss the rest of camp, they haven't ruled him out for week one yet. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to imagine that all of a sudden, like, Kadarius Tony is showing up in week one and making big plays. But it could happen, Boggs. It could happen. And, uh, you know, I've... I've should probably go to that 12 step meeting now <laughs> uh, it could happen so my thing here and the reason i wanted to pick somebody else you know kind of across from Kadarius tony was because i was like man i like Kadarius tony a lot is he as injured as i think so not only did i go and look at just the games he's missed but i went back and i looked uh like i scrolled all the way down rotowire and into like the weekly reports and not only is he constantly hurt but the games where he's not hurt a lot and this is why i hate mike williams is he's questionable to play most of the games that he even actually played because of these other injuries which is annoying as well so i i do think Kadarius tony is a better talent than sky Moore, but I don't think he's going to be healthy at any point in his career. He missed seven games as a rookie. Here are here are the ailments outside of COVID. You mentioned he got COVID twice. Uh, hamstring, ankle, thumb, oblique, quad, shoulder. All of those in one year. Last season, he had knee surgery in the offseason, and then he had knee or and leg issues in camp, had a ham, it, hamstring injury in between weeks one and two, and uh, missed a bunch of games, was traded to the Chiefs, and then he was magically healthy. Then guess what? Hamstring flared up again, and he missed some games. Eight in total last year. The difference in talent between Moore and Tony to me isn't enough, uh, you know, isn't enough to make up for the fact that Sky Moore will be on the field and Kadarius Tony likely won't. I mean, the old scouting trope is availability is the best ability, right? Being out on the field is a big part of it. And, you know, let's not forget also, Fitz, that Kadarius Tony. And I think the Giants traded him because of his attitude. That massive game that he had against Dallas, he got ejected from that game, right? Like, dude seems to maybe have a bad attitude as well sometimes. So, you know, you can't get stats if you're not playing. And then the dude has already had knee surgery this season, 
before the season started. And now they're saying we expect him back week one. How? You know, I expect to lose 75 pounds before week one. Fitz, I'm just going to talk it into existence, right? It's just going to happen. So while I do think Kadarius Tony is a great wide receiver and he's so much fun to watch and he commands targets, like you said, and he fights for every inch uh, of, of every blade of grass he is fighting for. That, that is why I love watching. He is tough. He refuses to go down. But I think that might also lend towards his injury stuff. I also loved Kenneth Dixon, uh, a running back out of Louisiana Tech who just ran, like you said, like he was angry at the ground and would fight for every extra inch. It caused him fumble issues and then injury issues later in his career. So, um, you know, I love the talent of Kadarius Tony. I love him in this offense. But I think I'd rather have Sky Moore. And I have reflected that in my rankings recently, which is not where I started because I am such a Kadarius Tony guy as well, like you are. But, you know, he's not on the field, dude. He's just not on the field. So I don't feel like I can trust him. Uh, I got one more wide receiver and then you got a tight end to end us out. So I'm just going to go ahead and flip this wide receiver out. And I'm going to say, Fitzy, that this is probably more of a rebuild move, right? Uh, my guys that are out there, you know, dynasty league, maybe you, uh, just joined and you're picking up a bad team, like our boy franchise that we talk to every single Friday. And you're trying to make a couple moves on a deeper roster, uh, before the end of the season. Let's not forget about Michael Gallup and, um, Gallup looks to be down right now. It's hard to argue with that, uh, with the trade that brought in Brandon cooks, but let's not forget that 89 targets evaporated with the departure of Schultz and 74 more out the door in Dallas with Noah Brown going to Houston as well. This year, Cooks will probably be the guy, but Gallup looks great in camp. And if he starts to look like pre-injury Gallup, uh, and he has so far in camp, Cooks, you know, he offers the second most cap space on the Cowboys roster if he were to be released next year, Zach Martin offers the most, but they're about to probably extend him, I would think. So probably not going to be an option to cut. And this is a team that I believe they're 23rd in cap space. They're um, only 6 million under before free agency and rookie signings. So they're probably going to be looking to make a move. Tolbert has also made a little noise in camp. So both of these like guys look good this season, Gallup and Tolbert then I think the chances of Cooks being gone next year for cap space are probably increasing. And Gallup right now is wide receiver 74 in ECR. He's a little higher on ADP at 63, but that's probably right around where he should be right now. And let's not forget, before this injury, Michael Gallup came out like a stud. He came out like gangbusters out of Colorado State. I definitely believed in him then. I'm a little more down on him now, and I think you kind of have to be because he is third on this uh you know, uh, depth chart here. And I know you like Jake Ferguson, but I just don't know that Jake Ferguson in his first crack at starting is going to command the type of targets that Dalton Schultz did. They got to go somewhere. Plus, you know, a bunch of targets gone from Noah Brown as well. So I think this should break out to CD lamb is a one Brandon cooks is a two Gallup is the three and then probably Ferguson four in terms of targets and the depth chart. And Tony Pollard is going to be in there as well. Being on the field more probably mean more targets for him, but Zeke had some targets. So let's just push them over to Tony Pollard. So if we're doing math here, still probably third on the depth chart, maybe not a buy right away, but you know, if you're down, you're on a bad team, there are worse stashes to to grab and take, especially knowing the financials on the back end with some of these guys. Now look, you know, those can be a joke. Those can be completely rewritten uh, and restructured and the Cowboys could have a ton of cap space. You know, I don't know a ton about that stuff, but looking at it right now, Brandon Cook seems like the most obvious cut candidate before next season. And Gallup looks good in camp and he has been, you know, pre he's been getting off press really well. And Trayvon Diggs, he's like one of the few guys that Trayvon Diggs uh, hasn't really bottled up every single time. So, um, you know, I'm just really excited about Gallup, and I think he's pretty much free now. And I kind of had a debate on who to pick in this spot between him and because I still like Josh Palmer too, but uh, I I, th I think I want to go with Gallup here. So, w what do you think about Gallup? And like I said, probably more of a rebuild move. But uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I can't argue with him as a cheap investment, Boggs. I mean. It his talent has never really been the question. I think um, 
pretty much outkicked his draft position from the start. Um, right. But now he doesn't really have youth on his side anymore. And I guess my main concern with him, even though he has flashed some ability and had some big time games, like I wouldn't mind Gallup in a dynasty best ball. And I'm in a couple of those there leagues. You go. But like there have been very few periods during his career where he has been a comfortable start in a managed league where you have to set a line, you know, like he's kind of one of those guys like, "Eh, I could flex him maybe in a league where you've got, you know, two or three flex spots and and have to go kind of deep with your starting lineup every week. Um, So do I think he has star upside? No, not really. But do I think he he could maybe um, become the sort of player who, if there are injuries around him, suddenly has brief spurts of value and is going to like pop off for some big games still? Yes, I, I think Gallup's that kind of player. So and and no denying the price is cheap right now. So here's a couple guys, and I think a lot of these guys in this area might be in the same neighborhood as Michael Gallup, right? Like maybe grab and stash, take a look at them. But a couple guys going above him right now, you can tell me uh, OBJ or Gallup. I think Gallup just oh, Gallup. OBJ is probably yes. a, a rental. Zay Jones? I don't know. I, Zay, I'll... I keep seeing Zay camp highlights, Boggs. Maybe I'm I'm too uh, caught up in those. That, that one's close. That one's really close. I, I see it. I just think that there's no opportunity for Zay to be uh, maybe even third on that offense, you know, uh, with Calvin Ridley coming in and they still have Kirk, who's better than him, and Evan Ingram. So, you yeah, know, Evan point. Ingram does have a bit of an injury history. Uh, John Mechie's up there, and look, obviously I would take Mechie over him, but... I've talked about Mechie. I'm trying to find new guys here for for you guys. So that's why I went with Gallup. Josh Palmer is right below him. He is a guy that I also had interest in, uh, that I was also interested in. Hunter Renfro also, but he is buried with Jacoby Myers now. I'd rather have Gallup than those guys. Rashid Shahid? I'd rather have Shahid, I think. Okay. And, and, And that's fair. He's a little bit lower. Tank Dell is down there too. Another guy, uh, that, that you could find some risk in, but I mean, Gallup, I don't know. I just think that Gallup could be number two. He might be better than Cooks by the end of the season if Mother Nature finally catches up to Cooks. And, you know, Cooks has never really stuck around long wherever he is. He has not been very liked by coaches and teammates. So uh, I don't know if that is just a weird coincidence or if that's something that he's doing. But, um, you know, he has bounced around all over the NFL. All right. So I, I got my wide receiver in here for my last one. So that's all five of mine. Let's hear your last guy. You got a tight end here for us. All right. Let's wrap it up with Noah Fant, Boggs. And um, Fant is still only 25, even though he already has four NFL seasons under his belt. <laughs> he had more than 60 catches and more than 650 yards in his last each of his last two seasons with the Broncos in 2020 and 2021 but Fant got to Seattle last year and played the fewest snaps he's played in any season since coming into the league um, even though he played in all 17 games for Seattle last year so it's not like Fant was benched he did play 60 percent of Seattle's offensive snaps but it was a strange role reduction for a guy who averaged a very respectable 7.7 yards per target last year and had a catch rate of just under 80 percent so Fant is still young, still one of the more athletic tight ends in the league. I don't know how the Seahawks are going to use him this year, but I do know that Fant is slated to be an unrestricted free agent after 2023. So, um, you know, if, if Seattle doesn't ramp up the usage, if he's still kind of an afterthought in this offense, there might be other teams willing to spend on a still pretty young, still very athletic tight end with uh, – some good seasons under his belt. Yeah, I like this one a lot. And this one to me is kind of like the Michael Gallup one as well. Like this is probably a move more for next year when he's gone, but also he's got an opportunity uh, to score some touchdowns with Seattle and have some value this year. I would say it's less likely in Seattle for him to pop off because they added Jackson Smith and Jigba, right? So now you have Metcalf and uh, you have Lockett and you have JSN. So those guys should lead in targets, no question. And then, you know, thrown to the backs, thrown to the tight ends and stuff like that. So I don't, I'm not in on Fant this year, but I thought he was better than Hawkinson coming out, right? Like I had him one spot ahead. I 
also thought Hawkinson was amazing, and he is. But I was more of a Noah Fant guy coming out, and he was more of the pass catcher at Iowa. Uh, so, you know, which is kind of funny saying pass catcher in Iowa. But, you know, he was a great tight end there. He was one of the better tight end prospects coming out until we saw Kyle Pitts. And I still think it's in there. And like you said, he's still super, uh, you know, young because he came in the league at 13 years old or whatever. I believe it was 21, actually. But, you know, still 25 years old. Got a lot of meat left on the bone there uh, for this guy to potentially grow. And, you know, plenty of teams need a tight end. And if he shows just a little bit this year, he could become a feature tight end for someone next year. So a lot like my Gallup move, I think it's probably one for next year. So and fan uh, fan has gotten cheap bogs. You could, you could cheap. probably, you could probably trade a bag of Funyuns for him. <laughs> I do like Funyuns, but I don't have <laughs> uh Noah fan rostered on uh, many, many teams. Actually, I don't really like Funyuns. They're okay. Uh, but uh, I'd rather have cool ranch Doritos if I'm looking for a chip. So uh, I'll say that I'm more of a Doritos guy. Uh, but we, we can argue that on a different show, uh, the, the merits of Funyuns versus Doritos. But that will wrap it up for our buy low guys on this episode. Remember, you can follow all of the excitement of Fitz going to the Fantasy Fest at Fitz underscore FF on the Twitter machine. Uh, you got your breakfast spot that you probably don't want to name right now. Let's just save that. Tell me about it when you come back. Don't give the name out again because you did on a, a previous podcast and everyone going right now. But I, I want to see pictures from the breakfast place, uh, from all the games. I want to see with all the people. And if you meet any of the people that we talk to on Discord, like I said, Friday nights at 5 Eastern, please send pictures with them. Uh, Fitz, that's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it, man. Uh, and you can find me on the Twitter app Bogman Sports. And we will see you guys next week. Take it easy, everybody.